Welcome to the chapter 11 lecture, and chapter 11 is really all about slavery. It's about as comprehensive of an examination of slavery in the southern part of the United States in the 19th century as you can fit into a single chapter. Now, with that said, obviously slavery in American history cannot be confined to one chapter of a textbook, and as we've seen in Give Me Liberty, Foner does not confine it to one chapter. It has appeared throughout every chapter all the way up to this point because of slavery's prominent role in the development of the colonies, the development of the United States, how it has impacted the economy, how it's impacted uh, society, uh, politics, um, and, uh, and culture as well, and even how slavery shaped early ideas of what it meant to be free in America, early concepts of uh, the meaning of American freedom, because it was really the juxtaposition against what it meant to be unfree, what they saw in slave society. And so the absence of unfreedom uh, would, or the absence of slavery is what defined what it meant to be free in early American history. And so slavery has played a prominent role in the development of the United States, and Foner gives, uh, gives it that attention throughout the earlier chapters. But chapter 11 is really examining slavery during the 19th century, between roughly 1800 and the point of secession, 1860. Now, we've seen how slavery has become a political and sectional divisive issue. And, and that's been brought on by the spread of slavery. And the spread of slavery uh, in the early 1800s was really brought about by a couple of things. We've seen that, that as Americans expanded further and further into, pushed into the Western territories, into the interior, forcing Native Americans off of their lands, they took with them uh, as they set up their farms looking for cheap land, they took with them uh, slavery in many cases. And so that brought up the issue of, okay, with these new territories, with these new states, are we going to allow them to be slave states or will they need to be free states? How far are we going to allow slavery to expand? And again, that created a political and ultimately a sectional divide um, between the North and the South. So we're going to look at that uh, throughout this chapter as we lead up to secession. But we're also going to look at slavery's role in the Southern economy, particularly as the cotton economy grew, the cotton kingdom uh, grew in the South and expanded throughout the newer Southern states, the deep South. And then we're going to see how it also drove the Northern economy, the, the textile mills of the Northeast and the shipping industry and the textile mills across the Atlantic and Great Britain. So we're going to look at slavery from that angle, but we're also going to examine, obviously, slavery's impact on society and culture in the South. And we'll look at that from the white perspective, particularly as we look at how it was that whites in the South embraced on a, on a broad basis and even defended the institution of slavery and not just the slaveholding elite, but the non-slaveholding whites. Why were they so welcoming of the institution of slavery? And then uh, we'll also look at the impact of slavery on black society and black culture. And what we'll see is that you know the slaves were in no way, and we've seen this in previous chapters, were in no way passive recipients of slavery, of that condition, right? There was constant resistance being exercised in a variety of forms. And we've seen it in violent revolts, but there's been silent sabotage where uh, the slaves would break tools or slow down work production. Other forms of, of discrete resistance where masters were slowly poisoned. There's evidence of that over time. Um, so there's that kind of resistance, but there's also resistance in the form of holding on to what you can control, some sort of autonomy. Uh, when you have someone constantly controlling really your every move, where you can go, when you can go there, what you have to do, when you have to start doing it, when you have to end doing it, you're looking for any form of freedom that you can, any form of control or autonomy that you can retain. And so we see um, an effort in slave society and slave culture to hold on to some forms of autonomy via their family life, via 
uh, folklore, storytelling, and songs, uh, or uh, religion. Um, and we, we're just seeing really a strong, the slave culture is really cultivating a strong will for freedom uh, during the 1800s. Uh, they definitely understand uh, the ideas and the principles uh, that this country was founded on, uh, which is this idea that people are born with this inherent right, this natural right to be free, that slavery is not a natural thing. It is wholly unnatural. And slaves fully understood that as the people who were most affected by it. And so these are the things that we're going to be looking at as we examine slavery in the United States uh, during the first half of the 19th century, or again, roughly 1800 to 1860. This lecture is going to be broken up into four sections, the Old South, Life Under Slavery, Slave Culture, and Resistance to Slavery. And so we'll start with the Old South. The focus question for this segment is, how did slavery shape social and economic relations in the Old South? By 1820, slavery was an old institution in America. With abolition in the northern states, the peculiar institution of slavery became unique to the South. By the Civil War, the slave population had increased to nearly 4 million, and slavery had spread to Arkansas, Louisiana, and eastern Texas. Slaves were one-third of the South's entire population and half of the population in the cotton states of the Deep South. Slavery's expansion was due to the growth of cotton production, which replaced sugar as the world's major slave crop. Though slavery persisted in Brazil and the Caribbean, Britain's abolition of slavery within its empire in 1833 made the United States slavery's center in the hemisphere. The Old South was the largest and most powerful slave society in history, based on the region's virtual monopoly on cotton. Cotton's use in textile manufacturing made it central to the Industrial Revolution in Europe and America and the most important commodity in international trade. By 1860, investments in slaves exceeded in value the worth of all the nation's factories, railroads, and banks combined. To replace the foreign slave trade that had been banned in the United States in 1808 under the constitutional rule, a massive internal slave trade developed. More than 2 million slaves were sold between 1820 and 1860, many of whom were transported to the Deep South to new cotton plantations. Virtually every slave owner at some point bought and sold slaves. The cotton kingdom could not have developed without the internal slave trade, and older slave states in the East came to depend on the sale of their slaves. Although the northern states abolished slavery, slavery affected them nonetheless. The Constitution enhanced the power of the South in the House of Representatives and Electoral College, remember that was the consequence of the Three-Fifths Clause, and required all states to return fugitives from bondage. Slavery touched the lives of all Americans. Northern merchants and manufacturers participated in the slave economy and profited from it. Cotton trade profits helped finance industrial development and internal improvements in the North. Northern ships carried cotton. Northern banks financed plantations. Northern companies insured slave property. And northern factories turned cotton into clothing. While slavery defined and dominated the South's economy, the South was a diverse region. In the Upper South, slaves and slave owners were a much smaller percentage of the population compared to the Deep South states stretching from South Carolina to Texas. The Upper South had centers of manufacturing, while the Deep South depended entirely on cotton. Yet slavery caused the South to have a very different economic development than the North. Slavery inhibited industrial growth, discouraged immigration, and slowed technological progress. It did not have large and diverse cities as in the North, except for New Orleans. Banks and railroad lines served plantations and little else. While many in the North thought slavery prevented economic growth, slavery was in fact very profitable and expanded the Southern economy. The majority of Southern white families owned no slaves whatsoever. Because planters had the best land, most white small farmers lived outside the plantation belt in areas unsuitable for cotton. They worked the land with the labor of family members, not slaves or wage workers. Many were self-sufficient and remote from markets. They were often desperately poor and more often illiterate than northern farmers since most southern states lacked free public schools. 
In part, because these farmers did not provide a market for manufactured goods, the South did not develop industry. While some poor whites resented the planters' economic and political power, most accommodated the planters and shared with them a common racial identity, business ties, common political culture, and kinship ties. Many white small farmers believed that their economic and personal freedom rested on slavery. Most slave owners did not own large plantations. In 1850, most slaveholding families owned five or fewer slaves. Only a small number of families owned more than 20 slaves. Even fewer owned more than 100 slaves. Planters' slave property provided wealth, status, and influence. They held the best land, they had the highest incomes, and dominated local and state politics and government. Small slave owners aspired to become large planters. Planters owned slaves to make huge profits, and they used those profits for the conspicuous consumption of luxury goods, creating an aristocratic material life sharply at odds with life for most Northerners. Plantations were part of a world market, and planters worked to accumulate land, slaves, and great profits, some of which they invested in railroads and banks. Planters did not celebrate competitive capitalism, but a hierarchical, agrarian society in which slaveholding gentlemen took personal responsibility for the well-being of their dependent women, children, and slaves. This outlook of paternalism had long been a feature of American slavery, but it deepened with the end of the African slave trade, which closed the cultural gap between slaves and owners. And most southern slave owners lived on their plantations, close to their slaves. Paternalism obscured and justified slavery's brutality. Owners thought themselves kind and responsible even while they bought, sold, and punished their slaves. Over time, Southern values diverged from the North's culture of egalitarianism, competition, and individualism. In the South, men of all classes followed a code of personal honor in which they were expected to defend the reputation of themselves and their families with violence if necessary. Dueling, while illegal, was not uncommon. Southern white women were even more confined to the home and the domestic ideal than northern women. In the 30 years before the Civil War, pro-slavery thought came to dominate southern intellectual and cultural life. Fewer southern whites felt as many of the founding fathers had that slavery was a necessary evil, and instead more started to argue it was actually a positive good. Racism, the belief that blacks were innately inferior to whites and suited for slavery, framed the pro-slavery argument. Slave owners also found justification for slavery in ancient history and in the Bible. Some Southerners argued that black slavery guaranteed equality for whites by preventing the growth of a white working class in the South. Slavery, they argued, provided the economic autonomy and independence that the Norse industrial workers lacked and which formed the basis of the Republic. Southern slaveholders were aware of the Haitian Revolution and other slave rebellions and of British abolition. Emancipation throughout the Americas strongly shaped debates about slavery and its future in the United States. While American slave owners argued that emancipation had been a failure, abolitionists disagreed. By 1850, slave systems remained in the Western Hemisphere only in Cuba, Puerto Rico, Brazil, and the United States. Nonetheless, the massive growth of the slave population in the Old South meant that there were more slaves in the hemisphere in 1860 than at any prior time. Many white Southerners claimed they were the true inheritors of the revolution's legacy, and they freely used the language of liberty to compare their condition to slavery. They complained that government interference with their economy threatened to, quote, enslave them. Southern state constitutions acknowledged equal rights for free white men. But in the 1830s, some pro-slavery writers began to argue that liberty, equality, and democracy were not necessarily beneficial to the South. South Carolina in particular was home to many who argued that freedom and equality were not universal entitlements, even for all whites. When sectionalism intensified after 1830, more Southern writers and politicians came to defend slavery not as ensuring equality between whites, but as the basis of an organic, hierarchical society in which white large planters ruled over lesser whites and slaves. George Fitzhugh, a Virginian, took this argument to the extreme, repudiating Jeffersonian ideals and the idea of America's world mission to spread freedom. He argued that slavery, not liberty, 
was the normal basis of civilization in world history and argued that slaves were happy and contented. He suggested that white workers in the North and South should have paternal white owners to care for them rather than be enslaved by capitalist markets and employers.